Gannibal Gaddis is one of the world's better known sports fishermen, and he's a resident of Maine with a home along the banks of the Kennebec in Bingham. He is known as the Flying Fisherman and has been flying since 1917 when in the military service in the Signal Corps prior to its becoming known as the U.S. Air Corps. He now flies his own red and white Piper Cherokee and has his own private landing strip at his home in Bingham. He's a main booster, but also has some criticism in the matter of recreational development, which he says is lagging far behind. How about it, Gadabout? Isn't it true that you feel we're missing perhaps a goodly bet in the proper development of Maine, uh, the potential which exists in bridging uh, new monies, bringing new monies rather to Maine and new enjoyment to the many fishermen throughout the nation is there, but we haven't been doing all that we could possibly be doing in this respect? You, you said it all right there, Miller. You really missed the boat in recreation in this country. You really have. I've been coming up here since 1929 even before that, and I know what's going on. That's, I don't mean just once in a while, but I really like this country. And as uh, far as recreation is concerned, and I've come to the conclusion that Maine is about 50 years behind in their publicity. In other words, they still use lobster pots and lobsters to advertise the state of Maine. And 90% of the people coming from the Middle West go up the coast and right back down the coast. They don't get into this uh, part of the country at all. Well, you feel that we're missing out on a good bet with the, the exposure of the things that are That's available? A, there's a whole lot more of the state than the state is in the coastline, you know. They've been publicizing the coastline. You know, we've got 3,000 miles of coastline and all that sort of, the rocky coast of Maine and all that. But you've got the most beautiful country in the world, right up here. Wisconsin, Michigan, I can name many of them. No better than this country right here. As far as you're concerned, you uh, are an on-the-scene man, being a property owner up in the Bingham area, so you have been able from first hand to discover these, these things which exist here and uh, perhaps are not normally known to the public at large outside of our own little That's exactly cul de sac. Right. That's exactly right, because uh, I know what I'm talking about. I've seen it for many, many years, and I have other people say the same thing. They say, I have been in the state of Maine, and I've been in the state of Maine, and talk to them, they find out they went up to the coast and come right back down. They've never heard of such places as Augusta and Bangor. It's like the people live in New York City. New York, all it is is a city, not a state. That's all it is. And now you... <laughs> So I think that now you take the Kennebec Valley. There's no, that valley is beautiful. Now I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Right here in this state right now, compared to any state in the world you want to mention, here's a river, and I brought it up yesterday. We go to Skalhegan and go north up that valley. How many motels do you see along that river? Most beautiful river in the world. There's no, there's, one, there's only one motel in Bingham. And, but along the river proper, between, I would say between, I'll pick any of them, Skalhegan to Waterville, 15 miles. There's no motels. It's a dead issue. You've got the most gorgeous stream in the world, and it should be, people should be on it with boats and fishing and enjoying itself. Property should be going up there to, at a, what a wonderful price today. There should be five or six or eight motels on that river right today. We're it's talking not. one river here, but there are so many All others. right, I'll, huh? I'll take any of the yeah. Penobscot, any river you want to take. They are not used like they are in the rest of this United States. They are not used, no. You drive it yourself, and you'll find it out. Why? Because I don't know why, but the people, I say that the, the biggest enemy this state has is the people themselves. Well, you make a good point here. Now, what are some of the things that we're lacking in? What are, uh, are we uh, trying to keep people away in general? The, the old-timer is. Not the younger folks are not trying to do, but the old-timers. I can even mention names, which I won't, but I'll take any small town in this state, and, and an outsider comes He's an outsider to the old-timers today. And I had a, about five years ago, when I, well, in 64, when I went into Bingham, I built a nice place up there. And I had five of the old-timers come to me and talk to them. And they said, you know what they said to me? He says, Vern, we're not interested. We've got everything we need. We don't want anything else. That's, that was all there was to it. That's the way it ended up. They're not interested. They're not interested in anybody else but themselves. Most of those fellows have made what they've got. They don't care for anything else. They're not thinking of the younger generation today, which they should think of, but they're not. They got what they want, they're all through. I've heard uh, one criticism when you speak about this segment of people, for instance, in the matter of hunting, that they say uh, groups of people from the outside come in, they come in for the hunting season, they organize in packs, so to speak, and then they have these, these great runs, and uh, uh, they organize this to such an extent that they dry out an area of game. You mean the, the outside? I'm talking deer, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true, because I, I live here. Your natives do the same thing. Oh, yeah. Don't you ever kid yourself. Now, not only in this state, but I'll take any state. Now, when you talk about that, I can take New York State, Vermont, New Hampshire, and any of them. Mm -hmm. They do the same thing. Uh, but I think one thing, when you speak of hunting, what's ruining the hunting now is your snowmobiles. The state had better pass law and keep snowmobiles out of the woods during the hunting season. So they can get back in and, and five or six snowmobiles and round up those deer and slay them like, like hogs. 
This is one of the big problems today uh, that you consider. It's one of the big problems today. Yeah. You, you, might, you might get an argument for those who are members of the Snowmobile well, Association. Well, that's too bad for that because there's plenty of things to do besides kill deer, you know. And they should stop that because in the western states and all the national parks, of course, you don't have too many national parks in this state, but at the same time, you can't even take an automobile or any kind of a vehicle in a park. you got to go in by horseback, but not, you can't drive in. Mm -hmm. What are you, some of your considered solutions to the uh, to straightening out the situation? That is, First of all, I think probably it's the people themselves. A new attitude must certainly be brought to bear. Uh, but then from there on, there must be some physical uh, changes that have to occur, some certain developments that have to uh, take place in order to make this attractive uh, program of planning to bring people in? Well, the state has got to spend some money on publicity. In other words, we should have a, a man in this state who knows how to handle publicity. I know of several men, and I know of one man who was in the states some time ago, but they couldn't get anywhere because the state didn't want to spend any money. Publicize the state. I can name several. Look at take the state of Florida, the publicity they get. Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, they're doing things now. They're so far ahead of the rest of this country in things that they've done in the southern states. They really are. They're getting the tourists, believe me. They're really getting them. But we're not getting them in this state. Now, I can show you if I want to go home and get, dig into a letter, at the, uh, hundreds of letters, and I get from people. Uh, I'll give you an example. I have, well, say, I, I can think of one or two right now that they wrote me a letter. They wanted to come. I answered the letter about fishing. So they came up, and there's... Uh, these two men, they're brothers, and they're from the upper, upper, way up in the upper New York State. Okay, so finally I got a letter from them. They had been up here, <laughs> and boy, they jumped onto me. He said, what's the idea? You're talking about the state of Maine. We went up there, and we went into a restaurant in Bingham. I'm going to name it, in Bingham. And while we was having something to eat, there's two or three men in there, and we talked to them. They said, you mean to tell me you come up here to go fishing? There's nothing in this country of fishing. You're crazy to leave. You had better fishing where you are than we got right here. And these guys were disgusted. So they went up the river, and naturally, after hearing this, they fished maybe an hour, not even get a strike, which is normal. So they pulled, packed up, and went home. Mm -hmm. So they jumped onto me about it. These people don't want these people here. I'll let you go right now. If you go in as a total stranger, go up there and try to find out how to go fishing, you're not going to find any information. Yeah, this is an interesting point that you make right there. Uh, perhaps the individual person has to be a salesman for the state. First of all, you've got to have the, the uh, uh, desire to bring people into the area. Now, That's this it. represents a tremendous amount from the standpoint of the economy of the state, doesn't it? It certainly does. I'll give you another example. I brought this out yesterday. I don't like to keep bringing the same thing up, but this is actual facts. Now, on the Rio Grande River in Colorado, that's way up. It's the headwater of the Rio Grande is on the, on, the, on the divide itself. Well, coming down through there, it's a gorgeous stream in beautiful country, just like you have right here. And the stream is half the size of the Kennebec, but it is clean. Now, every summer, there's 40,000 licensed fishermen in that valley. In that one valley, for, uh, by actual license count, 40,000 licensed fishermen. You go there today with a, twice as long as what you've got right here up the Kennebec Valley. You go up there, you see gorgeous homes that takes in tourists, beautiful motels, lovely places, a wonderful place to eat with good food, all through the entire valley. Now, you can't beat that. Look at the millions of dollars that's dropped in that valley. This valley, the Kennebec Valley, when they talk about the uh, economy and all that sort of thing, I can't go into that too far, but I do know this. There's been a great big holler about the paper companies. What a wonderful thing they're doing and all of that sort of thing. That valley up there for the tourist trade alone is worth 10 paper companies in dollars. It's worth 10 of them. It really is. It's quite a statement you make there. Oh, I do sure I'll make it. In other words, one small town told me, he says, look, he says, what do, you, what do you want to jump onto so-and-so about taking the pulpit out of the river? He says, well, we got people work on that. Well, the people in that town that worked on that boat drive was one man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you see the answer? Mm -hmm. I'm not against uh, uh, industry. I'm for industry, 100%. But that don't let industry control us. Don't let us, that, don't do that. We've, we've accepted a tradition in that respect, haven't we, in we the state? We certainly have, believe me. And there's been certain things said, we'll move out, we'll do this, and we'll go that big. What are they going to do, take millions of acres of land and move set it in Illinois? No. We recently had a, uh, well, just this past week, uh, a small paper mill in our immediate area that went out of business. One of the points they made was that the cost of pollution would be so great that they could no longer say. That's a good propaganda deal, I think. It wouldn't be that big a cost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, Scott Paper, or not Scott Paper, but Hudson Paper Company in Flatka, Florida. I just left that. They got the same problem down there. They got Rice Creek. You can smell it on a quiet day. You can smell it for miles. They, it's deadly poison. They're killing that whole river, the St. John River, from there to Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville can't say anything until they clean up their own mess, the city. And they got big problems down there. So 
They're fighting that now. So they had to, they dug a couple of big trenches out there and said, we're taking care of the pollution. And they dump water in it, go in one end, runs out there. They haven't done anything to improve it. I want to and get into this, this matter of pollution to a greater extent, Gad, about in just a moment here. I want to remind our listeners that our program this morning is with the Flying Fisherman, Gad about Gaddis, and conversation on Talkback. Usually we have telephone calls, but this morning our program was pre-taped, so no telephone calls. We'll be back in a moment in conversation. Get about Gaddis, the flying fisherman, our guest of the morning here on Talkback. We're discussing the matter of uh, conservation, the matter of uh, pollution, and on this particular subject, I have a quotation that I want to uh, bring to your attention, Get about, and then get your reaction to it. This was made, or it was supposed to have been made, by Mr. Arthur Godfrey just a short time ago at the National Association of uh, uh, Broadcasters. Unfortunately, he arrived late. He got caught in the fog and never did make his speech, but we got a copy of it anyway, and I thought this was interesting. It says, we are smug in thinking that all the resources of the world existed for man alone in inexhaustible supply. We have depleted our soils, decimated our forests, ruined our swamps and estuaries. We have so fouled our fragile atmosphere that we have actually created an oxygen deficiency. Our rivers are so polluted they smell like clogged toilets. Our lands are defaced with, uh, with strip mines, highways, and dust bowls. Our once abundant wildlife has been poisoned or trapped or shot for sport or bounty, and our cities are collapsing under the weight of our garbage and trash and sewage <clears throat> and the turmoil of greedy politics. Our city streets are filled with a noxious stench of buses and cabs and trucks and pleasure cars, question mark, jammed bumper to bumper from early morning until early, uh, early morning until early evening, not to mention the hapless throngs gasping for breath, trudging through their own trash and filthy droppings of their leashed and miserable pets. What do you think of that? I think it's very good. <laughs> it sure is. And he's right. He's right. I have seen streams all of this country die. Kennebec is one of them, dying fast. From Calhegan down, it's dead. It really is. On up above, because only the reason we got what we got there now, we got fast running water. If we didn't, it was, it was continue to die. You go up above in the lake, the Wyoming Lake, go up to the headwaters of it, where, right across the head of it, where they block it off, and they hold that pulpwood back. There's 300,000 cords of pulpwood lying there all winter, and they stay there until they get it out. And they deny it. They can't deny it. I call it a de debarking machine. It lays there and so it gets soft and falls off. They've got mm -hmm. 10 to 20 foot of pulpwood on the bottom of that river, 6 to 8 to 10 miles. Kills everything that's in the bottom. And that's one good say to save to debarking it when they bring it into Skowhegan and Waterville. Now, that should not happen because there's nothing can live in there. It can't live in there. All the marine life underneath that is dead. You go down there now on the river right in front of my house. 25 years ago, you could turn over a rock and see all kinds of marine life as food for fish. Go down in front of my house now and start turning over 200 rocks, and what are you going to find? Nothing. Because it's been killed. It's been dead. That's what I mean. I'm not, look, I, I, uh, I'm not talking about for the fishermen. Let's let the public remember that. I'm not saying, well, let's do this for the fishermen. You mean for everyone in it's general, the enjoyment of If you've got clean water, you've got fishing. So let's forget the fishermen, you, because the average man will say, well, now, why should I spend money and my tax money to clean up a river for some jerk to go fishing? <laughs> That's not true. It's not. It's for everybody. That river belongs to the public. Let's give it back to the public. The Scott people can still use that river, but let them use some judgment. Let them clean it up. Let them clean up their own mess that they've made in that river, and they're continuing to make on it. The log driving company, they don't care. A statement was made to a good friend of mine not long ago which I don't mind saying it because it is absolutely true. One of the representatives says, we are, have no intentions of cleaning up this river. Take, I mean, taking out the pulpit of this river. They have no intentions of it. What is your evaluation of the programs of uh, the federal uh, decisions that have been made in the matter of cleaning up rivers? Well, I haven't checked in it too far, Norm. I really haven't, but uh, I've been so wrapped up in what I've been trying to do, but I do a lot of the reading I can. But to get the, some, in some of the states, there. The federal government has done a lot, and so the states have done a lot. It's up more up to the state than it is the federal government. Our state right here could pass this, some laws, can, can force them to do these things and do it right, and do it right now. But you can't wait on it. You can't wait. Look what, look what happened in 10 years. What's going to happen in the next 10 years? You're not going to have water. I mm -hmm. mean that. A lot of people say, you're foolish. We'll always have water. Yeah, you have deadly poison water, but you mm -hmm. can't use it. Of course, one of the things that uh, has been most dramatic is that which happened up in the Presteel Stream. Yeah. And you're probably aware fully of the, the situation so. in, in that territory. Uh, and this, this is an, uh, the type of thing which has uh, developed, I suppose, in many cases around the, the, the uh, state as a result of industry having gone in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the things that we're really talking about here, cleaning up these, uh, these areas that are really for the people, as you, you speak about, one well, of natural resources. There's been so much talk about, for example, like uh, water control. 
Now, we don't have water control in that the, the Central Maine Power Company and uh, the rest of them, who the, the, the log drivers, they all do it. They cut this thing off. Now, in Bingham, at night on that big power plant, they tell me right there, and I live and see it, they, their load is picked up somewhere else. They shut all the generators down, and you river drops down to nothing. You can walk across it with a pair of low shoes. Now, that's not right. Now, what can live in it? There's no reason for that because I had a meet, I was at a meeting in Bingham about three years ago, and I think it's three years ago. And they had the, all the, the game department, everybody up there, and uh, several biologists. And I was kicking about this low water. They should control it. And when I got up, I thought it was a game. I, I put the question right to Mr. Spears. And he got up and he said, yeah, that's not my department. That belongs to Otis Bacon, who has control of it. So he, I, I talked to Otis Bacon about it. And Otis got up and he says, well, it's never been brought to my attention before. This was made before 100 people, my attention before, but there's no reason why it should be like that. But nothing has been done. Mm -hmm. They continue to draw that water right down to absolutely nothing, and there's no reason for it. Because all through the West, and I can bring in advertising and newspapers and magazine advertising in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, all through the western part of the country where the power companies put in big ads what they are doing. They are on water control. They have water control on the Snake River. They even advertise that in the month of August, they will draw the water down just enough so they can make float trips. That's a big business in that country. Then in the latter part of August and two weeks into September, they draw it down so you and I can wade a stream. But mm -hmm. they never bring it down low. Nothing can die in it. But if, when you go down there sometimes, see a trickle of water that wide in that big river, it's a bad thing, man. Yeah, is our situation in the state of Maine perhaps worse than what you might find uh, around the country? I know you get around quite a bit, so yeah, you're yes. able to determine. Yeah, because they've done more about it in all the western states, you see. And now, of course, and they don't have this problem in, uh, in New York except in the Hudson River, which is a flowing sewer. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, the western country, now like in Idaho, and uh, there was a potato plant processing a plant opened up here about two or three years ago. And the first 30 days of operation, they had a fish kill, a big one. The state shut them down right now until they corrected it. They shut them right down. In other words, the laws in some states are uh, much more severe than what we have up here because we're pretty lax. Here. You get caught throwing a beer can in the lake from out in the western part of the country, and they catch you, it costs you $100. You just throwing a can in there. No. <laughs> it's a serious thing, Norm. I mean, it's so serious. I can't. I don't know how to really elaborate on it and make it, people feel how serious this thing really is. Then this has to be a matter of each individual citizen. It isn't uh, something that somebody can slough off very easily from the standpoint of uh, just an ordinary voter, for instance. He has to become concerned. It's, a, it's he, become a personal thing with the individual as opposed to just making these statements and somebody says, well, this is too bad and, and I don't do anything. Well, here. Well, again, the, the citizens got to get busy and get a hold of the, the boys and the legislature and do a lot of writing. And the, and the states themselves have got to pass some laws to stop this sort of thing. Because I, I'm only not jumping on the state as other places. They're doing the same thing. They, they'll tell you, said, look, we're going to do that, taking care of this. It's going to cost a lot of money. We've got to, we're going to make a study of it. it, it we have it on the drawing board. That's what you hear. I, they've been, I've been told five years ago, oh, we'll take care of that. Now it's this, come out here, we got it on the drawing board again. They'll never do anything until they are forced to do it. And then the, this forcing of... That's up of, to the state. Yeah, but it's going to come from the people who are going to have to want this to, have to begin with. The people are going to have to it, but the average Joe will look at the river and say, look, there's nothing wrong with that river. It looks all right to me. Mm -hmm. looks all right, but let him drink it. Uh, you know, that's what you ought to do, Norm. You ought to open a program every morning. Good morning, folks. Have you had your glass of pollution this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody's already uh, jumped ahead of me and has already thought of that idea. The, uh, there has been some encouraging uh, points that have been made from the standpoint of fish coming into the Kennebec, at least as far as Augusta. You know, at one time we said there was nothing left in it, but apparently we've got something coming from down below, like salmon. Well, not, uh, the salmon reached Augusta. He sure had a big job getting up over those dams. How'd he get up here? I'm not sure, but they, they <laughs> told me they've been fishing for them. Well, they're not... Right not, off the not, wharfs uh, in Augusta. And they, well, that's probably Atlanta. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not Atlantic salmon. They come from somewhere. Yeah, it's not it's not a clinic yeah. center. Uh, about uh, just changing the conversation just a moment, I understand that uh, you do do quite a bit of traveling. Uh, and uh, can you tell us the biggest fish you've ever caught? Saltwater? Well, the uh, biggest is, was a sea bass and in the uh, Tampa Bay in 1927 on a rod and reel. Uh, a 780 pounds, 760 pound uh, sea bass. Oh, that was a big one, wasn't it, huh? He's big. He's just like a big old tank, though. He's not fast. How'd you t how long did it take you to land? Oh, it didn't take too long. Not too long? Maybe half hour. If you get his head up the water, you got him licked. Of course, you got a head, and you can put a wash tub in it, a mouth. And he's worth, at that time, I sold him for two cents a pound. 
<laughs> ah. Where's the best fishing today? Well, the finest trout fishing is in Montana. Of course, naturally in West, you still got fine trout fishing. You used to this, you know, this was one of the greatest trout streams in the world at one time. Well, Kennebec. Yeah, oh man, I fished this way back in the when they before they built this dam when they built the dam. What fabulous fishing, fabulous fishing. But you see now you take them, bring them on down when you go along with the power company, the Central Maine Power Company, would take bulldozers and and drag lines, straighten out this river. They get rid of all the spawning beds for that. The game department is going to bring back the brook trout. You can't bring back back brook trout in that river. It's impossible. And uh, what the, I think the, the best fish now for that river is brown trout. They'll survive in that river, and they will spawn, but not mm -hmm. brook trout or rainbows. Rainbows, of course, you know, they, they spawn this time of year. Big floods and high water wash them out, and mm -hmm. they, they kill mostly all the spawning beds around there now. The fact that you're a resident of the state of Maine gives us hope that uh, perhaps you think that uh, there's still hope left in the state of Maine. Yeah, we, if we get it now, we can't wait any longer. Yeah. Though. We just simply can't Time wait. Time is of, of the great importance. Now, right? for example, I'm fighting for this. At my age, I'm not going to cash in on this, Norm. I won't be here. But there's a lot of generations there's youngsters that's coming up. Let them have a place to go fishing like I had. Otherwise, there won't be anything. That's it. I want to thank you very much, Gad About Gaddis, for being our guest this morning on this very interesting conversation having to do with uh, some very important topics. And wish you much success in your future efforts in the world of fishing and also in your uh, capacity as writer and as also a television narrator. Well, just so I don't get shot or burnt out, I'll be all right. <laughs> very good, sir. <laughs> thank you, Norm. <laughs>